says buns. Recording buns. So buns, I'm representing buns here. Buns is a, a, a barter app in Toronto uh, that also launched a local currency um, that is maybe the most popular local currency in the world. I don't know, but I'm happy to go with it because it confirms my biases. Um, Marco has dropped off the call because he was otherwise naked and this is being recorded. So if you wanted to do that, you'll have to contact Marco. <laughs> and otherwise, we are talking today about fork accountability and about handling <laughs> evidence and so on and questions around, you know, how much tenement should uh, how much work tenement should do on the evidence front versus how much the application should do. Um, right. I guess one question I had, and I'm sorry I missed the discussion on Monday, but is there some particular reason we couldn't just make evidence a transaction that like SDK apps have to support? Yeah, we could. The, the only, so the, so two concerns. One is, um, all applications, you know, even apps that don't use the SDK that want the same evidence functionality will then have to re-implement the same kind of thing. So that's not great. Um, but, but arguably the more significant one is that we, I think we want to treat evidence different at the network layer. So it should be prioritized over other transactions. And given that, you know, this, this could be just a matter of improving the structure of the mempool to have like more priority based uh, uh, mechanisms in there, but, uh, you know, until then, or even given that, I think we want, um, evidence to be treated differently like it is now where it's just like kind of gossiped epidemically, mm -hmm. uh, even more so than transactions. I get that, but it does seem that the mechanism could be general that applications might have other reasons than evidence to want to prioritize transaction gossip. And maybe that would require some other like calculate that's, transaction priority ABCI thing. That's true. Um, so do you think, so you think this evidence could just be handled as special transaction types and it'll just be up to um, applications to validate and verify and everything? I mean, it's an option. One thing I think that is likely is that some, probably not most, but a small subset of SDK chains will want fairly complex evidence handling logic if they are supporting some sort of cross-chain validation or doing more complicated kinds of correlated slashing. Uh, you know, unless Tendermint integrates all of that, oh, they would end up doing it themselves anyways. Yeah, that's a good point that we might be kind of opening up a rabbit hole. Well. No, because all, all Tendermint does, so the, the intuition is that there's only a small number of things that actually need to be detected. And, and those, that set of things can be programmed into Tendermint, forwarded, you know, the fact that they were detected in the parameters of them can be forwarded to the application and the application can take care of the rest. So even things like correlated flashing and so on, as far as I know, all fall into that category where Tendermint just has to detect, oh, there was equivocation here, there was invalid headers there, you know, tell the app about it and the app can see, okay, I saw this many equivocations over this time frame, so you get slashed this much. Correlated slashing, I think, does fall into that bucket, but cross-chain validation probably does not, because in that case, what the application cares about are equivocation faults or fork accountability mismatches in a light client that's being tracked in another chain so that will always need to be like managed in the state of the application because it's not the consensus instrument in instance that tendermint is tracking it's a different one maybe with the same validators or some of the same validators hmm. but, but, the app but what are you publishing evidence of in that case you're publishing evidence of a double sign but on another chain another chain for which this chain runs a light client right the application might want to prioritize that in the same way if we want. In this case, I think this is a, this is a, this is probably like a, a orthogonal concern because this is application logic. It has, uh, it has nothing to do with the, with the tender mean, uh, uh, yeah, but, well, tender mean misbehavior. Yeah. But what he's saying is that it's going to be the same kind of thing and we're going to, so therefore we're going to end up programming all that stuff into the application anyway 
And so why not let the application also handle this other, like the application is going to want these kinds of like prioritizations over how this evidence style stuff gets managed at the gossip layer. And therefore like forcing this requirement of having Tenement have like a separate reactor to do it and all this stuff built in may just be redundant or unnecessary given that a, a lot of it is coming to the application layer anyway. I mean, I don't know the details of how this protocol will look. It's just an idea. And I suspect yeah. it will be the exception, not the rule. Most sovereign chains using Tendermint aren't going to do this. Um, right. So maybe for that reason, it's not such a big concern. We would just end up with duplicate logic in that case and whatever. Uh, I just thought it was worth bringing up. No, it's a good point. Mm -hmm. Definitely a good point. No, my, like my first intuition was that uh, most of the, of the evidence handling will, will happen at application level and that maybe at the tenement level will just detect uh, it and then you know, forward it up. But, uh, but I'm not anymore sure on this. So it seems we need to think a bit more about this. But I have a kind of uh, some, uh, some concerns before even we come to the evidence handling about evidence creation, actually. And mm -hmm. um, uh, most particularly, I think that there are two main uh, issues. Uh, the first one is about the amnesia uh, kinds of attack, where we need uh, to run the, this full fork accountability protocol, and uh, and so the uh, I'm trying to write it down. Uh, apart from what we have in this four document, so just we have a more clear requirements uh, of integration of this thing with and. Um, it seems that the, more of the requirements we have right now are that uh, we need to define the, so somehow every process need to, to say to, to the rest of the system, what is their vote set um, in the point of, uh, of a fork. Like in case we detected a fork, now we essentially all validators are kind of accused and if they're not able to prove them being correct, they are faulty. So it's a bit uh, kind of uh, the reverse logic mm -hmm. of the justice system. Guilty until proven innocent. Exactly. And all are guilty in case there is a fork. And, uh, and there you need to essentially, we need to have from every process uh, at least a hash of the vote set, which it will be used as a proof of uh, correct behavior. And once we have this information, then the monitor can run the, the protocol, which is like a relatively simple function on those votes set and define uh, or create evidence of misbehavior. In that case, we don't really have uh, necessarily like a simple evidence. It's more like the, the output of the protocol saying yeah. the faulty guys. This that's also not, uh, that's not in protocol, right? It's we not. Actually, it's we not. actually don't need to consider as far, you know, given this, Given that amnesia can't really be detected until it resulted in a fork, we actually don't necessarily need to punish it. Uh, we don't need to like include it as evidence in the protocol. I mean, amnesia could be detected, but uh, the yeah. problem is this kind of synchronous nature of it. This, uh, like, if for example you see a pre-commit message without the proof of like enough pre-votes, this is it's like this is something which you can detect in process. Uh, and maybe, you know, even like with some sort of challenge response uh, in protocol, we can do this. Like periodically, for example, if you see pre-commit, you, you send a, a challenge ask, you know, asking for like, uh, give me the pre-votes which are covering uh, this pre-commit, something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, or like, uh, yeah, it could even like uh, spread in between multiple rounds, which is kind of a bit more tricky. But, uh, but in case of fork, uh, we know that that uh, uh, that it's detectable if a measure attack was launched, and but in this case we have this synchronous nature uh, of uh, of the fact that we need to know what are the what is the vote set on which we are running a protocol. So we cannot run a protocol on like uh, any set. Uh, so we cannot just rely on the local information and the correct process, because this might lead to a different conclusion. Yeah. So we somehow need to timestamp the vote set and say, okay, now on this data, I run a monitor and this is output. And then this is something which is checkable by every local uh, full node. Sure. But uh, the question is how we integrate this with the, with the main chain. 
and like uh, like for example one idea would be that after the fork is detected uh, for example like line fork is detected we publish this uh, evidence of fork so it's not evidence necessarily of misbehavior uh, in this kind of complex attack it's just that it means like there is something wrong uh, but we might not necessarily uh, be able to detect what is wrong. And then after, uh, after this is, is uh, published on the chain, we, we expect from all uh, validators which are accused of potentially being faulty to publish their hash of the vote set to the chain. But it's not, uh, it doesn't go to the chain anymore, right? Like the chain already broke, so it's all kind of off chain at this point. I don't know, we, we talk about the, the like client only attack. We don't talk about the main chain attack. But a like, like client, I see. Um, but amnesia succeeding on a like client could then be replayed against a full node. It's, re it's basically equivalent to detecting a fault, like a full fork, right? Yes. I mean, it can also be on a full node, but we don't necessarily have the, like, validators. I suppose, I suppose what we want to happen is that once it's detected at a light client, someone replays it against full nodes so that everyone sees that there is a fork and they all halt. But do we want to halt in this case or just punish the bad guys? Because validators, like, on the main chain, we don't have any problem. Yeah, I didn't really think about the fork happening to the light client and... and um, not then being replayed. Yeah, I was kind of trying to d differentiate between the uh, really fork on the main chain versus attack on the light client. Yeah, I'm using fork, uh, but uh, yeah. but like if there is a if there is a some light client is being attacked, like do we want to stop the cosmos hack? Probably not. We just want to punish uh, both of us. Well, is it? It depends on the attack. If it's a, if it's a plus third of a, of the current validators that a, you know conspired to attack a light client, like sure, we should stop the hub. That's uh, you know that's bad news. But it could be that we have more than one third of guys which used to be validators, but they're not anymore. Yeah, but then they then. Uh, so yeah. why would stop the hub? Yeah, 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 yeah. They could still attack the light client with amnesia. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, but if the light, um, in that case, we should be able to punish them on the hub. Exactly. Exactly. So, so we don't need to a matter hub. of doing the detection, right? Which is, which would still require still requires this whole fork accountability thing. Yeah. The question yeah. is really like how. So uh, let's assume that there is a, there is a monitor process. And monitor purchase is, is like, a, it's a simple thing. It gets some data, it compute a function, and then, you know, it can maybe publish this, this result of a function on a chain in form of transaction. We now need a mechanism that every validator can detect that what monitor suggested is indeed correct. Because monitor also could be fault. You know? And uh, one way to do it is to essentially uh, ensure that the input data of the monitor are uh, the same at all correct process, so you it, so every correct process can check the the computation of monitor. But then uh, uh, we have some again some kind of synchronous assumption there. Like for example, we detected evidence, we then publish it on the on the chain, and then we give a day or like I don't know how how much time every accused validator to publish the hash of their vote set to the chain. If they don't publish, we you know they're faulty and. Uh, and this is like the absence of communication in this case is a proof of misbehavior also. Uh, if, they, if they publish vote set, then, uh, then we might think about a way how to essentially disseminate the vote sets between the correct uh, mm -hmm. validator so they can all check the computation of monitor. But, I mean, they would still be publishing it on the chain, right? In this case, the chain is still continuing. We, we have run the monitor on chain, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that doesn't seem too terrible. The synchrony assumption is odd. It means that like previous validators, even if they weren't malicious, have to stay online and pay attention in case this happens. Exactly, exactly. So there's a very, uh, like, I suspect it will be a counterintuitive change. Yeah, but like if you are if you are still like during uh, unbonding period, 
I mean, this is something which then uh, probably should be supported at application level. Like at application level, you need to have uh, some sort of notification mechanism or, or uh, you know, you need to, to, to more or less be able to mark at application level that some, uh, some full node or some X or, or current validator is accused of being uh, faulty. And, uh, and this should, you know, raise an alarm and a validator that they should do something. But um, I'm, I'm not saying that this is like the, the, the right way to do it. It's just that it's pretty complex. And so I'm trying to just figure out. No, like, I get it. I mean, why couldn't it be automatic if we assume the validators just continue running their nodes throughout the unbonding period after they stop being a validator? Yeah. And their nodes, as long as it continues to process network traffic, can respond yeah. to the challenge with a response. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. We just need to, it would, it's like, different than the usual model. So we'll have to communicate it. Yeah. Like the question is uh, like, do we want, I mean, this amnesia thing, it's, uh, it's sort of, it's a realistic attack. It's not like that we can assume that amnesia will never happen. So the, so we probably need to find a way to address it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, you, right well, now- the other, option, the other option is to try to fix it in protocol. Yes. But that's, you know, that might be, I mean, that would resolve a lot of these issues, but, you know, then we have to, then we're going back to consensus. You mean protocol change tendermint? Yes. Change tendermint, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, we even don't know whether it's possible, but uh, it's worth of giving it a try. Well, we know it's possible if, we, if we're willing to sacrifice, like, all of our performance. Uh, I, this is what I mean, that it's not possible. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Like if you piggyback all, all history, then it's possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you just call it Casper, then it's possible. Yeah, exactly. So by having the constant message, uh, still having constant messages, this is what you should try to do. Yeah. Uh, not like adding uh, infinite amount of data and saying that it's possible. So, but like uh, short term, the, uh, we don't know how to do it. So this this might be uh, it might take quite some time to figure it out. So in the meantime, like, do we want to try to to implement this kind of a bit more complex, uh, or, or like maybe there is there is sort of uh, uh, even more simple version of it that like uh, in case of uh, fork being detected, we kind of fully trust monitor that it will uh, it will compute the stuff and it will not uh, it will compute it correctly essentially, so it will not cheat uh, like. Uh, from whom data are received or, but this is like, uh, it, it breaks them all a bit. Um, it really put a lot of uh, responsibility within a monitor itself. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like we need to, um, it sounds like we need to program the monitor onto the chain, right? As need, so monitor can be off the chain, but you need to verify it on the chain. This is very different, so because then uh, uh, it's like, for example, like with a with a proposal. Yeah, 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 yeah. You need the verification on chain. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, but then so there's there's two cases. The one case is the the people that conducted the amnesia attack uh, were validators in the past, but are not anymore. In the other case is they're currently still validators. So in the former case. We should be able to punish them on the on the existing chain. In the latter case, uh, we can't punish them on the existing chain because they can censor it. If they have more than a third, it's possible that there's a mix. Also, one presumes. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. If more than a third are, it basically, there's really only two cases though. Either more than a third are still validators or not. Right. Yeah. If they're still validators, they can't be punished. Uh, if they're not, they can. So. If there's if they are still validators, then there probably should be some way to inject like the bad block or the bad header or something and stop the chain, um, so that we can go into the off chain fork accountability. But how how they can censor it? This is the question. Like if a correct validator received the like sort of approved. Yeah, they can just not vote on blocks that include the evidence. Yeah, but then we have a halt. We have like, a, we have a halt on the fork chain because they would, uh, no, not no, necessarily. because they can just, they can just wait until one of their own proposes a block and then vote on that. Yeah, but like uh, we could imagine having uh, in that case requirement 
that uh, only the proposal with evidence is considered valid. Like if we know that there is a pro there is a evidence, then uh, it cannot be ignored. But what does it mean to know there's evidence if we don't have consensus? You receive the like you are correct, like that, and you see you receive from I right, yeah. Yeah, true. So it's really like a transaction, and then you can just ignore a transaction. This is true. Yeah, yeah. So we need some way to we need some way to halt the chain if the if there's a, if a light client got fooled and there's still more than a third. Yeah. Otherwise, we can run the monitor and then submit the result of the monitor to the chain to be verified. Yeah. So like uh, in in the case where if there are still uh, validators, then then we essentially really need to halt the chain. And we need to rely on a social means to still using evidence we generated, but just uh, we cannot process it automatically in the main chain. Right. In the other case, we can design a protocol. Probably now, how complex it would be, this is still to be seen. But uh, we can probably design something which can be computed out uh, out of the chain and then verify on the chain. Do we necessarily know with the evidence, but before the challenge response? if the um, validators who committed the fraud are over a third now? The, there, is, there is like uh, even oh, like a different question. The uh, different question is like in, when, you, when you see a fork, you don't know whether it's an amnesia or like equivocation or something like that. So you first need to figure out what kind of attack it was and then you need to figure out what you would do. But you don't know necessarily if the if the if the plus third is is still validators. I mean, this is dynamic. It can change every second. So, like every six second, it can change. So, what does it mean at that like uh, at point in time we compute? Right. That this this you know this is also changing. So, like uh, every six second, we might be in a different case. Yeah, but even even if we assume that that were fixed, and if we had epics or something, it could be conceivably. We still don't know until they've had a chance to respond to challenge response, right? Yeah, so, case, uh, do we? Let me see. So yeah, essentially, so this part is happening asynchronously. So, uh, and this is also what makes it uh, actually uh, very tricky. So we have dynamic validator sets. So they're changing all the time. And in parallel with this, we detected a fork and we want to run a monitor. And so monitor uh, as a requirement need to obtain vote set from the validators which are involved with the fork. Um, and they, you know, like now their status is in parallel changing all the time potentially. So even like once we compute the thing uh, and say, okay, uh, now at time T, we compute it, we know that, you know, P1 and P2 are faulty. Now their status also is keep changing, you know, so. Uh, so like probably the best thing we can do, we can always try to send transaction and see, you know, like if it doesn't go, if it's censored, then we can figure out in what case we are like, and then raise a social thing. But it's, it seems very hard to do this as a, as a kind of um, at a cold level, like that we are sure that all in all cases we you know we, we know what we should do. I mean, at that point, maybe it's better for nodes which have seen evidence that's not included to just not vote on the proposal. And hope that eventually enough of them gossip it, the chain halts. Yeah, it's I, I not a very sure like, thing. Like uh, I, I don't know whether this is reasonable or not, but like that, that the uh, validators can offer some kind of uh, hotline for evidence submission. In this case, that you have like the, you have a, essentially a direct line to submit evidence, and then uh, after uh, validator, you know detect this and he doesn't manage to process it within again a day then you go to the uh, you, you raise a, a issue at a social level but uh, but this might be kind of additional service offered by validator that they, they kind of promise they will trust to push the transaction 
I mean, we can always do that sort of thing, but it seems very subject to how validators actually behave and pushing complex protocol for accountability details onto social consensus seems like something we should really avoid unless we absolutely have to. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, this is fun. So where, so where, so where does that leave us? So, um, yeah, there, there's also one more thing just before, uh, uh, it's also related and it's in case, uh, like client also. So like client detect the fork, uh, because like, uh, it assumed that, that the full node he's talking to is, is correct. And then, you know, it cross check with some other correct node and see that header is mismatch. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, what the light client should do. Uh, this is also, I think, very important because a point at which you detected a fork might happen like, I don't know, uh, half an hour or five hours after, essentially there was really like the first fork on the chain. And then after you were completely, you know, like fooled and you were talking with the, with the validators which were not even um, bonded or they're not slashable. And now, you know, like uh, uh, unbonding period is very long, so it could be a lot of headers. And uh, what like client can do in that case? Like, uh, you know, because if it, it submits that uh, as an evidence, this is, this is nothing because uh, we, we don't have, uh, these are potentially guys who are not unbonded. These are fake value so we cannot slash them. What do you mean? How, the, how could the light client be fooled by validators that aren't slashable? So, assume, that, <laughs> assume that at time T, there was really a fork. So some slashable identities were involved. Mm -hmm. But yeah. then they changed the state. Uh, and they essentially, uh, by doing fork, they elected the validator set in which there are no slashable validators anymore. Or there is a small percentage of slashable validators there. Maybe yeah, but then the light client would have requested a header for T. Uh, so the but you haven't detected because you haven't talked with a correct client at that point in time. Sure, but you stored the header. You stored the header exactly. Now you keep you keep talking with a full node. You keep downloading the header, uh, and in the meantime, you try to find another correct node to cross check the things. Uh, and then maybe there are 1,000 or one, you know, like 10,000 headers after you detect that there is something wrong. But like the root cause of the of the issue is in the past. It could be like 10,000 headers in the past. Oh, I see. I see. Well, you should search, right? Yeah. And now, how we do this? So how we, you know, is it responsibility of white client to do the search? You know, uh, try to do some sort of again bisection with a full node to find this, this crossing point, uh, or we, we somehow assume that the full node should do this and I, my client should just dump the data to the full node. Or... If we have an honest full node, the difference between the light client making a lot of requests for headers and the light client sending some of its headers to the full node and asking the full node to compute things doesn't seem super relevant from a security perspective. So if the full node can do it, that seems easier. But yeah, it might it might sort of open DDoS uh, DDoS attack uh, possibility because you can just uh, you can just send a, a bunch of uh, of crap to full node, and he would need to try to validate this and figure out what's wrong, and if there's really evidence or not there. But I assume somehow that there is still a responsibility of client client to try to create evidence. Uh, where there is there is overlap in terms of the validator set with the correct node. Like, uh, then the light client will need to make a lot of queries to this honest full node. Exactly. Uh, or the light client doesn't even know which at this point, so it will make queries to both full nodes. No, oh, wait, no, the light client can't. Sorry, I. Um, I got a little bit hung up on the example you were trying to give Jarko about the light client being fooled by a header with validators that are not bonded. Initially they're bonded, you know, and so when essentially when you are attack, uh, let's say you are attack at a, at a height H, mm -hmm. at a height H there was a fork clearly. And at least we have more than one third of faulty guys, which are slash. 
but the fork itself is changing the validator set. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the forked state, maybe uh, only you know, like I don't know, ten percent of uh, of these uh, validators are are still present, and the rest is uh, just uh, some bogus guys who are actually not bonded at all. Yeah. And so now you can't, you can't jump like you can't do bisection and jump to that because you need plus third plus a third overlap to jump. At height h you can't but then at h plus one or h plus k you can right but won't the light client then see the conflict at h not at h plus one what if he doesn't see because at that point in time he doesn't talk he is eclipsed and he doesn't talk to any correct well, number. you're suggesting that later on so light client but you can't see h plus one without seeing h see yeah a so it's seen h but the light client doesn't know h is a fork until at some future time it sees h plus n uh, like a different h plus n by another full node that isn't an equivocation but that conflicts with the h plus n that the light client knows and now the light client has to go find out like where was the equivocation is that the yeah. example exactly exactly that's the point yeah that's possible yeah, I don't, now I don't know how, uh, this is something which was kind of puzzling me because we don't know, you know, how n, uh, how, how bad this n could be. Uh, I mean, with our current uh, P2P layer, uh, we don't have any guarantee that you will have a chance, you know, to go out of equivocation uh, because we don't have any sort of random pure selection built in. So you might be eclipsed for quite some time. Um, but eventually, somehow, you know, you figure out that, that you were eclipsed. And now we need to figure out, you know, to go back and find H. Because for H, we have a slashable valid address. And yeah, I mean, if the light client can query the honest full node, they can uh, do binary search just to find, like, where the headers start to differ. Yeah. And once they know where the headers start to differ, they should be able to find this specific header in log, log time. So it doesn't seem well, so it basically means they can't they can't they can't just submit the first evidence the first sign of conflict they have to go back and find where the divergence actually happened yeah exactly. unless we're willing to offload uh, but well not even then they still they would need to send a lot of headers to the full node if they want to offload to a full node because the header which is equivocation is the header at h not the header at h no but they already have the don't they already have the data? They just have to go back and look for it? I mean, they could. one thing we could do is try to include an incentive for submitting evidence, and then they could send all of their headers to the full node, and the full node would be, it would be in the interest of the full node to find the one that was equivocation. Mm -hmm. Probably also tell the one client about it. That seems possible. Yeah, like the sending like the header with a, uh, with a full commit. Or a lot of blocks might be might be a way to just uh, you know to DDoS a full node relatively easy, or just to overload it because the and it might take also a lot of time uh, considering that light line might be a mobile device or uh, well you should be able to do you should be able to do some kind of logarithmic search against the full node to find the the header that differs right. For, yeah, I think this is like the most reasonable thing. I just wanted to to check if if uh, you know what are the whether it makes sense to consider about the other option. But uh, somehow, uh, uh, what is I, the other option? The other option is the light client sends all their data to the full node. Yes, I think that does make sense to consider. Yeah, yeah. So the it seems that there is a trade off there, and it's, uh, it's not an expensive operation. If like the light client sends all their head, you know, it's bandwidth expensive, but it's not compute expensive. Uh, the full node just like checks for each header height, looks at the height, and says, "Do the state roots conflict?" So, yeah, yeah it's just the data. Uh, you know, potentially a lot of data. But uh, if you do, if you do the uh, some sort of uh, smart search, uh, then then you will potentially just detect a few clicking, and you will just submit them. Then, yeah, I mean, you could do both. You could combine the protocols, like the light client requests a few headers, narrows down what it has to send, and then sends its headers. Yeah. Well, yeah how I much headers are we talking about? Like, well, how, how many how many headers 
should a light client store like from the beginning? The light client needs to store on bonding periods worth of letters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the 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 bandwidth we were talking about should be logarithmic in that number of header headers, right? Because you should the light client should be able to do a search against the full node until it finds the first conflicting header, and then it can just submit both of those. And yeah. that would be that would probably be less bandwidth than just submitting all of its headers to the full node. Yeah, maybe more because maybe you know, like the few first few headers after H still contain the slashable value address, but not the one after. But um, yeah, but we don't know this. This is kind of this is what is hard. That like uh, maybe you you know like in all headers there is elements for for slashing. So, mm -hmm. because they, you know, it was not like there was not a, a, a significant change of the evaluator set, but they just kept trying to fool the, uh, the light client and keep signing the uh, bogus data. And uh, in that case, we might want to slash them also for all heights, not just the first time they did it. Well, at least in the SDK, the way slashing works is you only get slashed once and then you're out. Okay. Yeah, then in that case, uh, at least for SDK, then, then it's enough just to send it, the first one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like this evidence detection thing is, is like, um, it seems like that there is also some complexity there. Well, and no. uh, yeah, I will try to write down uh, a separate, um, separate file just on evidence detection. To, I, to say more or less starting from what we have right now in this fork accountability document, like for essentially every evidence type, what kinds of evidence uh, mechanism we need to detect it. And in, in case of uh, amnesia or this, uh, I don't know who called this eclipse attack, uh, just to try to list a few options we have there to try to detect it and then to process it after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sounds cool. Yeah, I mean, but, this is also why I like to make the distinction between the, you know, a light client having verified a header and a light client having actually trusted a header just to buy it more time to, to have seen conflict. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think some light clients might want the option to delay finality just for this reason, to wait yeah. some clock time period, 10 minutes yeah, or exactly. something. Exactly. And try to make as many queries as they can and submit stuff. Like if you're transferring a million of, do of dollars over IBC, you should do that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, that's interesting. And so, uh, what, one more thing. In the IBC world, is a does the correct full node assumption equate to correct relayer? It equates to there exists one correct relayer who can submit transactions to the like client in question. But you basically want to make sure you're hearing. But like in the IBC world, then before you trust a header, you want to make sure you've heard from multiple relayers, or that you have the opportunity to hear from multiple relayers. Right. Yeah. But how do you, how do you, how do you distinguish opportunity versus, uh, like what's the equivalent of the eclipse attack on IBC? Uh, either the relayers don't exist or they can't submit transactions to the chain. Right. This is like the bounded transaction synchrony. Transactional, but yeah, yeah. bounded transaction. Transactional liveness, sorry, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which in some ways is, or should be, more robust uh, because not if like someone who wanted to hide an equivocation would have to deny data availability not to a particular light client but to a whole validator okay. set. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's right. I mean, I think in practice, light clients are going to be able to deal with this by um, having sets of somewhat trusted full nodes that they require themselves to have connected to, you know, to help mitigate uh, Eclipse. Like if you, you know, if you have an HTTPS URL and you're like a set of three of them for three trusted nodes and you like require that you get to two out of three of them plus 
you know, other random peers. And for, if you're being eclipsed, you're not going to be able to connect to those unless yeah. the eclipser is colluding with them, you know, obviously, but you know, threat model can't extend forever. So there is, there is an analog of that in IBC, uh, relayers could be staked and they could be staked against, uh, equivocation such that if an equivocation were later discovered, their stake would be forfeit and even potentially usable to like socialize or collateralize the losses. Right. But I think if we can solve problems before we get to that level, yeah. wherever possible, we should. Be nice, yeah. Right. Well, yeah, I guess in the sense, full nodes could be staked. Full nodes could be staked as well, right? Like like client providers. Yeah. Yeah. So so relayer in IBC world uh, could see like a fork uh, by uh, you know talking to to some full node. At, at the source chain, and it could, uh, on purpose, submit the this forked uh, data to the destination chain. That's right. Okay. The, the term used throughout the IBC specs is misbehavior, as it's intended to generalize beyond equivocation. Okay. So in this case, it's really like relayer who is kind of creating the the fork on the destination chain. On purpose, because he saw like that there there is a two state at the at the source chain, and uh, like the correct relayer uh, will you know raise some issue there or submit evidence and not submit the forked state to destination chain and create even more confusion there. Uh, Do you see what I mean? Well, both. Are, I mean, the correct relayer or the honest relayer will do what you said, but the dishonest relayer may also you know, submit the invalid state and try to deny data availability to the honest right. or something. Right. It will be so funny to see this in practice. <laughs> At the moment, everyone's too altruistic. Okay, so um, yeah, it sounds like we have a lot, we have some writing to do to try to capture all this, everything we've talked about. Um, and yeah, figuring out exactly what the protocol is for the light client to um, detect precisely where the conflict was with bonded validators and that, or yeah, with slashable validators and then be able to submit, you know, just the conflict um, to some correct full node. Um, dealing with amnesia for validators that either are, you know, current or not current. So in some cases we'll have to halt the chain and others will be able to just publish the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one is, yeah, the invalid headers, which seems a lot simpler compared to, to the amnesia stuff. Cool. And so do, do we want to try to also formalize this idea of, uh, uh, like lifeline finality as something which is uh, maybe, I don't know, application specific uh, concept where you really try to build in this into lifeline. Then you essentially need to define a function after you have seen the valid header, there is additional function or additional check which needs to be satisfied so the user and user see the, the data as well. Yeah. yeah, I think we should do this. The IBC spec already does. Okay. Although also for some other reasons, like to generalize it to Nakamoto consensus more easily, but I think it applies here too. Okay. Yeah, yeah because it seems so, uh, I mean, it will not necessarily uh, deterministically uh, help us in all cases, but it just seems like very bad not to do it. Well, the useful part is that it can be parameterized on like the application level. So if people are checking things, the incorrectness of which would be extremely bad they can be more conservative, but if they're buying coffee, they don't care. Yeah, true. Okay. It's hard to explain that. <laughs> we have like some risk level in the app, like risk level green, risk level yellow, I don't know. Right. But it's essentially like function, which uh, after the, the header is valid or, or I don't know, the, the state is valid, uh, I don't know yet if, if probably should be defined at a header level. Like you say that the header is valid, 
you need to you need to provide also additional uh, additional function like we do for a block right now we also assume that there is application specific function valid which define whether block is valid or not so for header like uh, considering this valid you can assume that application <coughs> in this case like line need to define if it's a time based threshold based whatever url based we can maybe give some hints but uh, it's essentially up to the user to do it yeah okay okay cool lots to do um so to kind of come back to you know original questions around tendermint and should tendermint you know should the should does the evidence reactor really belong as an independent thing or should it eventually get lumped into some prioritization mechanism in the mempool that's question one um and question two is how much uh should um how much should tendermint do about like checking evidence versus forwarding things to the application since the application already has all the data versus tendermint having to duplicate storing you know everyone who was a validator over the unbonding period i don't know if we're necessarily going to be able to answer that right away but um on number one, on the first, on um, I think it should be its own thing, just because once we move to more modularity, some people might want to replace the mempool, and if they have to adhere to certain evidence um, assumptions, then it might be harder to build a more custom mempool for a use for an application. Um, and a, and also, once we go in the mempool and start refactoring and start lifting the mempool to the application layer, for them to be able to handle it, if that's something, it's on the six month objective then it might contradict some stuff with the evidence or it might make easier evidence if it's combined. Right. So if that's the case, then I think it means Tenement does have to handle this. Uh, oh no, it doesn't. We just, we no. Yeah. So um, I guess they're orthogonal. So that's one. So that's good. It sounds like we, we do need to keep a, keep these mechanisms separate. Um, and then the other question is, is whether or not we should use a check evidence or have Tenement. Um, manage all this stuff i don't know if anyone has strong opinions on this um yeah i guess maybe maybe it would be worth trying to write that up as well at least the distinction between the two options i can try to work on that maybe next week um, um i know uh so bez just joined the call and he's writing he wrote the adr for the evidence module in the sdk um but kind of like, I guess in your opinion, what would make the most sense on like as an application developer on your front, Bez? If you're what would make it? Yep. Um, you think you're asking what would make the most sense from uh, from the application standpoint of whether Tendermint should handle the evidence submission versus it being submitted outside of Tendermint? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like it's basically whether or not we need to add check evidence to like whether Tendermint will be able to tell for itself if evidence is valid or if it'll need to run it through the application. I mean, my my initial inclination is that it should run it through the application. Why? Uh, well, for starters, it may have it has all the data uh, necessary in order to validate that evidence. That's right. Yeah. Right. Um, not to mention, I don't know if you mentioned the fact that Tenderman would also have to store. Uh, are we duplicating evidence if we if we allow Tenderman to do this? We're duplicating data. Basically, Tenderman would need to keep uh, would need to maintain a set of all the. I mean, it's not that much data, but it would need to maintain a set of all the validators that have been active in within the unbonding period. I mean, the thing is, like that's the, like the application already does that, right? That's right. So it just seems more a more natural place to do it. Yes, um, but it means, you know, it's one thing to solve this in the SDK, but it's another to say that every application that wants, you know, this kind of functionality is going to need to, going to okay. need to cover all this and do the signature verification okay. and so on, right? Like, 
it means the SDK is going to need to verify, you know, Ed 2519 signatures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and any time of the, you know, validator pub keys change, mm -hmm. the application needs to, you know, be able to account for the new signature types. Yeah. So could it potentially be more of an opt-in feature? Like Tendermint does support this, but uh, for example, if your application doesn't want to handle direct evidence submission, then Tendermint, you know, has well, the ability to do it for you. If Tendermint's going to support it, then why bother with letting the application do it? Because sometimes you'll, you'll receive like complex uh, evidence, like for, uh, as Chris said, for like cross. Um, well, but that's not, I yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that that's just within the consensus, right? That's evidence, yeah. evidence semantically, but not really like, it's not on the same level, right? Do we think there's a notable differentiation with regards to how different proof of stake protocols might want to differently handle evidence. Like the SDK also determines the proof of stake protocol at the moment. And it might be the case that if you're not using that or something close to it, maybe you don't care about evidence or maybe uh, don't need to handle it anyways. In which case it's fine if Tendermint tracks it, but it's also fine if Tendermint doesn't track it. Right. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, if we're talking about having to implement the fork accountability protocol, like, it, there's a lot going on there. So to force every, every framework, every ABCI framework to have to re-implement that, you know, maybe that's a lot and to deal with, uh, um, you know, there's going to be duplication one way or another. So either we're duplicating data on who was a validator recently, or we're duplicating all the code for verifying some stuff in all the different ABCI frameworks and so on, which, you know, maybe will make the ABCI ecosystem more mature, but it's also more work in every language and um, probably harder to keep it all in sync, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, does, does the, sorry? Go ahead. Does the app store headers for the whole unbonding period? No, but we can. Yeah, so you'll have to. Yeah, we can. I shouldn't, that should be pretty trivial. Um, yeah. As far as tender minutes concerned, what, would, what exactly would you need to store again? Just the entire validator set for an unbonding period? Uh, yes, everyone who has been a validator within, the, within an unbonding period. Hmm. Does that introduce like um, uh, then like does introducing the notion of an unbonding period into Tendermint even uh, is like that too restrictive? Like, what about frameworks or applications that um, don't have such a notion? If they don't have such a notion, then uh, certain kinds of evidence won't be relevant, I guess or certain kinds of light clients won't be possible. So certain kinds of evidence are only relevant because they can fool light clients. And so if, you're, uh, if your application doesn't, ha doesn't support something like an unbonding period, then you can't have, say, like a bisecting light client, which means certain kind of evidence won't be relevant because your light client, the kind of light client you can use, wouldn't be fooled by it. And so okay. it would, would mean there's some kind of parameterization around the proof of stake and light client at the tenement level. And this is all, yeah, this is stuff we, we would have to work out. Right. So it would introduce that complexity into tenement um, rather than just say punting. I mean, it'd be nice to just punt it all to the application. Speaking as someone who works more on the tenement side. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, right. Okay. There's, you know, this one, there's going to be complexity no matter how we slice or dice it. But yeah, yeah, it sounds like maybe it's worth kind of writing up the the landscape here. So it's a little bit clearer and written down and then we can, we can pour over that. Yeah. I mean, given the, given the nascency of proof of stake and some of this light client work, maybe it makes sense for now to leave it at the application layer and let mm -hmm. things evolve a little bit before we decide to really bake it in. 
to figure out more about how things will be parameterized and so on. But yeah. you know, the base case might be developed enough or understood well enough that we could put it in tendermint, but um, yeah. But I think we don't need only to, to track uh, validators during unbonding period. We need to know in what heights they were validators in, during unbonding period. Because like uh, if you, you yeah you, you, if you sign in some height and you were it's within an unbonding period but you were not validator in that height then this is a then you are a phantom otherwise you are you are fine. But I think we only need to. Um, I think it's it's only we only need to worry if they signed an invalid thing. So if they weren't a validator, but they signed a valid header, we don't we don't really need to process it. <laughs> right? Um, I'm not sure about that. Like, uh, if you're not a validator, you shouldn't be signing. Like, they still could still they could still fool a light client conceivably, but it would be correct. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not really fooling. I guess that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> It's fooling in the sense that it's a header that the full node wouldn't have accepted. That a sync sure. that full node wouldn't have accepted. But the state is the same. The state is the same, yeah. So, so okay. Who cares, yeah. I mean I'm I, you know, I've been trying to kind of whittle it down to the least the 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 kind of smallest set of rules for, for punishment. Um, we could broaden it, but then it means we kind of have to track more information. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that one buys us too much, but yeah, I don't think it really does. But I agree, yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, I guess um, the the follow up here is to try to write write this all down. Okay. What's up? So as, as far as the evidence module, is that still kind of uh, in flux in, in the sense of, you know, it being needed by IBC or are we still, is this all for discussion whether or not Tendermint will handle this? Any sort of cross-chain validation will need something that looks like an evidence module, regardless of the outcome yeah. of this discussion. Uh, okay. Yeah, is that, sorry, so can you give us a bit of context on the SDK's evidence module, like what that's, uh, what's that, what that's doing and what it's for? Well, the initial primary motivation at the moment is counterfactual slashing, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris. Yeah, that was the original reason, uh, as the result of some previous discussions with Zaki, and Jay, I guess, when we sort of decided to put that yeah. in the SDK. It sounds like that's being reconsidered, but. Yeah, that's yeah, what we're talking so. about here. But in case, in case we decide to implement this at Tendermint level, uh, do you still want to check this at the, at the SDK level or you will trust Tendermint for this? No, it'll trust Tendermint because Tendermint won't forward the data for the SDK to check it anymore. So, but mm -hmm. sorry, I just want to, um, with respect to this counterfactual slashing thing, I, I don't know that it's like just punishing for counterfactual slashing isn't enough. So I don't, I'm not sure that it's really valuable to just to think about things in terms of counterfactual slashing. It's really about signing invalid headers. Yeah. Uh, whether you were a validator or not, you know, so long as you're within the unbonding period. So that's what, that's what, that's what it's kind of been generalized to. And uh, yeah, we're talking about whether we're going to track that capture that in Tendermint or whether that's going to come in as into the SDK uh, to verify itself. And uh, yeah, right. So it, I, I, I didn't quite understand um, that evidence module stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it sounds like, you know, if that work is moving forward, then it kind of requires uh, kind of a check evidence on the Tendermint side. And uh, potentially an evidence type that is just arbitrary bytes so that right. it can be, you know, dealt with on, uh, by the app. Yeah. Yeah.
What's yeah. still unclear to me at the moment is uh, with within the scope of the evidence module, what the interaction looks like between the app and Tenermit when evidence is submitted, like the handler for the evidence. Is there interaction with Tenermit at that point? So there's, there's two options here, right? So like currently the way we, ha we, we only have one type of evidence, it's equivocation. Tenderment mm -hmm. takes care of all the checking and it just tells the app, hey, here's the validator that equivocated, you know? And so there's no checking for the app to do. It's like, okay, now I, now I know what, you know, who misbehaved, I can deal with it, right? Um, my thinking initially was that we would extend that to these other forms of misbehavior like signing an invalid header um, and so once again, Tenermit would be able to detect it, say, okay, here was a validator, he was bonded, he's no, you know, he signed an invalid header. Um, we can tell the app and then the app will be like, oh, this guy signed an invalid header, you know, nothing to check, you know what went wrong, right? Um, and then it would work the exact same. But the alternative is that instead, Tenement would, would, be have, would start to have to become agnostic to types of evidence. So people would submit evidence as if it were transact, you know, very similar to how they submit transactions mm -hmm. uh, as basically arbitrary bytes. And then we would introduce check evidence into the ABCI. Actually, in this case, we, we, uh, uh, oh, uh, so yeah, we'd have some kind of check evidence in the ABCI. So Tenderman would then receive some evidence, forward it to the, to the app as check evidence. The app would unmarshal it, check it, blah, 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 tell Tenderman whether it's valid or not. And then, if it's valid, it'll go into the evidence reactor. Tenement will, will gossip it. Uh, it'll eventually get included in a block. And then once it's included in a block, again, uh, it'll need to, during block execution, we will need to also run this check evidence command. We could call it deliver evidence, I guess, but really they should do the same amount of work. So yeah, maybe we would need deliver evidence. Um, and then, yeah. I mean, if we do that, it seems to me like the trade-offs versus just making evidence a transaction lean in favor of just making it a transaction and giving the app some way to tell Tendermint to prioritize certain transactions with the network layer. Because the app has to implement all the evidence handling logic anyways. Anyways, yeah. So anyways. Having like extra ABCI things doesn't seem justified. I agree, uh, but then it just like puts burden on mempool implementers, which I don't necessarily think is, you know, mm. that much of a problem. Um, but I mean, even, even right now, if we were to do this, you could have like one bit that indicated whether a transaction was evidence or not. Sure. Kind of do the same thing. Sure. It just, and then we would just collapse the evidence reactor into the mempool reactor. Yeah. Or rename it the high priority transaction reactor. <laughs> sure. Sure. So yeah, that's um, that makes sense. I think. Right. So what was the what was the argument in favor of like the the inbound header stuff being um, processed at the application layer in the first place? Was it just because it has all the, it knows who all the validators were over the unbonding period? Like it's already storing that? That was part of it. And I think originally the idea was that it would be faster to implement in the app. I don't know if that's true now, given that we've decided, discovered all this additional stuff we have to deal with. Right. But in the discussion with like Zaki on that phone request, that was one of the reasons. Why. Okay, so I guess it should be looking at the pull request and the ADR. Uh, oh, it is the ADR, yeah. Great. Um, okay, so I'll take a look at that. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, what what about uh, what about the light client in a, in a, in this case? Like um, it will have to know how to unmarshal like a particular evidence. For example, I'm running a like client, which is connected to like a, some nodes, some full nodes, right? And uh, full node, one of full nodes receives an evidence and it like transfers this evidence to the like client and the like client will need to unmarshal it. And 
detect that one of the full nodes, like another full node, is trying to cheat it, for example. Mm -hmm. Wait, why is, the, why is the evidence being sent to the light client? Um, I thought it's a valid use case, like, isn't it? Well, I think the light client just needs to see a conflicting header. But can it be that, like, um, a bunch of, yeah, like we're all running white clients and one of us detects that somebody is trying to, uh, somebody, somebody is misbehaving and he will send an evidence, which is, which gets gossiped and then goes to yeah, all the clients. other just, like clients. It's like an alert basically to tell all yeah. the other clients that something's up. Um, I mean, it's optional, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it could. What's that? I mean, this could be possible if the the light client will will uh, be connected to the system at a P two P level. But uh, I think we'll not do this. So I think we'll uh, right. we'll, we'll try to not, connect at the socket level uh, to the full. Not nursery, not nursery. Like full nodes can can uh, transfer evidence to the light client. So it can be like bi-directional communication. Ah, I see. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it could be that could be roughly simulated by full nodes giving the light clients headers that conflict with what they've seen. But um, mm. giving them the evidence directly might might somehow be more efficient. But yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, like we were, we're, we're already asking full nodes for the headers, like validators, next validators. And why, why not ask for an evidence, which is... But the, evid but the evidence really just consists of a conflicting commit. So even if it's treated as, a, as bytes, uh, you know, over ABCI or whatever, to for the light client's sake, it could just come in the form of two conflicting commits. And then the light client would already know how to deal with those data structures. So um, we could treat it like that because the light client isn't going to have to process like more refined evidence. It, it's because it only just deals in commits, right? So yeah, I mean, the case we are concerned about is where the light client has accepted some commit and there's a conflicting commit and the evidence would contain both, but the light client already has one. So what's the advantage of like sending it again? The full node can just figure out what it needs to send, which commit. Send it the other one, exactly, yeah. Or even just send it both, Just you just send it as commits. It doesn't need to be unstructured data. Yeah. So the like client right. only deals in that, whereas Tenement deals in more refined evidence types, yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's a good point though, that the, the like alerting mechanism to tell other like clients somehow more specifically. Um, yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing that is like plausibly prudent for the light clients, which are running on computers or phones or something to do once IBC is up and running is to run light clients for two chains, which also run light clients for each other over IBC and cross check. Or you can expand two to N here, but. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. These light clients aren't going to be so light after all, huh? Mm -hmm. Should we just should we just halt until zero knowledge proofs are good enough for everything? I mean, you still have to store the headers, right? I guess so. That helps with bandwidth, but it doesn't really it helps the bandwidth compute, but not really storage. Yeah. <laughs> storage is cheap. I don't know. I think light clients will be relatively light. Yeah, obviously. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, it's a fun exercise regardless. Okay. okay. So I think, uh, you know, we covered a lot of ground here. It seems like we, we still have some work to do on writing and deliberating around really the trade-offs and where, where things should happen. Um, so I'll note some of this in the Notion doc. Um, Jarko to work on uh, fork accountability. Uh, no, fork detection. Detection and submission via light clients. 
and uh, Bucky to review uh, evidence module and write up um, trade-offs of putting this in app versus Tendermint. Right. Uh, okay, any other takeaways from this currently? I like we're probably gonna have a few sessions related to these, um, both the detection and submission part and then the actual punishing parts. These are the other two components of the light client. The first being the actual, you know, given the trust assumptions hold, what, you know, how do we verify headers? It seems we've actually wrapped that up. Um, so that's nice, that can, be, that can be coded and assuming you're talking to a correct full node and they're, they're, you know, less than a third validators are faulty, everything will work swimmingly, but you know, we're planning for the edge cases, so. Um, great. Anything else we should discuss today, now? Cool. I guess that wraps I this up. I think that's everything, that's the only discussion. Cool. Um, yeah. Just for the sake of my understanding. Are you working on the light client implementation, Anton? You um, yeah, but there are still a lot of questions unanswered. Like, yeah. Yeah. Do we you should... plan to write it in such a way that the verification logic can be shared between the IBC light client and the local in process client? Of so course. Like, of work? course. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we should, I mean, we should be able to move forward on the implementation, at least like the data structures and the and the verification for, um, for the trusted case or for the trust assumptions hold case, um, and then we'll have to fit in all the rest of the stuff around you know, talking to multiple full nodes and um, doing that efficiently, verifying efficiently, and then submitting evidence and all that. But yeah. And that and that stuff um, that stuff might not generalize as nicely to IBC. We might need, you know, to just have different sets of code for those components. But that's I guess expected. No, but it still it still should be possible to separate verification logic yeah. from patient yeah. detection. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. All right, I will stop recording. <laughs>